For years and years, you've been told that even though Jesus Christ died for you, it is still your responsibility to fight this enemy that you cannot see. And no matter how much you pray, no matter how much you try, no matter how much you hope, you never seem to be able to catch this enemy. You never seem to be able to overcome him. Could it be that the real enemy you're facing is hiding in the last place that you would ever think to look? Well, today, I'm going to get you some answers. Welcome to the Living Word Show podcast. I'll be your host and teacher, Shalakia Shaba. Do you know what I believe that God wants for you? I believe that he wants you to live in the kingdom of God and to have a thorough, deep understanding of his word. And that is precisely why I'm here. And that is my mission. I believe that God wants you to live a kingdom lifestyle and that the kingdom of God is here now. And God's invitation is for every single one of us to not only enter this kingdom, but to possess the kingdom of God. I've got a great teaching in store for you today. I have been looking forward to sharing this topic and I'm going to tell you more about um, recognizing that you don't have a devil problem because Jesus dealt with that enemy for you. However, you st you might still have a mind problem. So <laughs> that's what we're going to address. But before we do, do me a favor, go ahead and subscribe wherever you're watching, wherever you're listening. Uh, give me a thumbs up, hit the bell notification so that every time I go live, you can receive a notification and be sure to look for me on social media. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. You will be continually uh, just doused in inspirational messages, different clips from uh, teachings that I've had over the past few weeks and just a lot of, you know, inspirational uh, motivational things that are going to keep your mindset on the word of God. So do uh, follow me on those channels. And we're going to actually go straight into today's teaching because I have a lot to share. And so if I talk really fast, just know it's because I'm trying to fit a lot of in information into a limited amount of time. But I trust that God is really going to bless you through this word. You know, I chose this title. You don't have a devil problem. You have a mind problem because it came to me as I was standing in my home one day of like looking at what's just going on in the church and just having a one liner that can get people's attention to say, hey, wake up. You're fighting the wrong battles. And if you don't wake up to the truth of God's word, you may find your whole life having been spent on something that wasn't even your fight to begin with right so why am i teaching on this today because number one i believe it's true after being a born again believer for 22 years a, a avid student of the word of god having done different ministry schools read different books read the bible cover to cover three times like i am on a hunt for truth and based on all the evidence i've put together in scripture i realized this is what the bible is saying and I believe it's true. The second reason why I'm doing this is because I have seen how Christians, the church, our focus on fear, our focus on the devil has really incapacitated the church and has left so many believers living without the authority of the kingdom of God. So that's my passion. That's my reason for doing this. And as I was preparing for this teaching, I said to myself, and maybe I'm I'm giving a spoiler, which I have a tendency to do this a lot. I give the conclusion of my message at the beginning. <laughs> I can't help it because I'm like, let's just get to the good stuff. You know, I mean, all of it is good stuff. But I just I want to state my conclusion at the beginning is that why would the Bible even bother to tell you to renew your mind if Satan is on the loose? Like, think about it logically with me. If there's a bad guy out there, I'm like, oh, yeah, there's this bad guy and he's trying to get at you and he's trying to kill you. Oh, but by the way, don't forget to be transformed in your mind. Like, why would that even matter? Why even tell me to renew my mind if the devil is out here on the loose? But if the devil is truly defeated, like the Bible says he is, then it makes sense that you would need to transform your thinking so that you can participate in God's kingdom on earth. Amen, somebody. Well, 
that's my introduction and that's my reasoning behind why I'm doing this. And um, I hope the title doesn't offend you. I'm not trying to offend. I'm not trying to accuse, but it is sort of a, a catchy way to get your attention to say, hey, wait a minute, make sure that you are in the right battle and you understand who the true enemy is. Otherwise, you could spend your whole life going in circles and never arriving where God wanted you to arrive. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, you are amazing. You are wonderful. You are everything that we need. And I thank you for this privilege. Many of us listening, watching, we don't live in a country where we're persecuted for reading the Bible. We have full freedom to spend time in your word. And we are so privileged to be a generation that can have the Bible, that we can go deep into the word of God and allow your word to wash us and, and cleanse us and make us um, into the image of Christ. And so this is my prayer, Lord, that um, as we study your word, that the outcome of all of this would be that we will be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ, that we would know him and be known by him, God, that your name will be glorified in us and through us, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, you are the comforter, you are the teacher, and I pray that you give it to each and every person a spirit of revelation, a spirit of understanding, O oh God, that we would hear what the Spirit of God has to say on our insides, and we will give you all the praise and all the adoration in the mighty name of Jesus. Let somebody say, Amen. Okay. Like I said, I'm going to go super fast. I apologize ahead of time. You can go back, rewind, replay this as many times as you need because I'm on a go. I have a lot of information. For those of you listening, you may want to check out YouTube because I got slides. I got presentations. I'm telling you, I came prepared. I came with receipts. You hear what I'm saying? Like I'm going to make my case and I'm going to leave you and the Holy Spirit to decide if this is the mind of God. Okay. First of all, I don't want to spend too much of the discussion with the first part of my premise. So I started out by saying, you don't have a devil problem, but you have a mind problem. So I'm gonna attack this point from two uh, directions. The first thing I'm gonna attack is, you don't have a devil problem. I'm gonna prove that, but I, I hope to spend just not even 10 minutes on it. Cause I'm just like, I have covered this so much. If you just go back to my YouTube channel, um, I did, even recently I did, God has a purpose for you part one. I think that was episode 14. I detailed very thoroughly Satan's defeat. He's not our enemy anymore. We are still in the realm of darkness. We are still in the day of death. However, it is not Satan himself. It is not the chief that's out here doing stuff. So I explained that. And also way back in 2021, I did another episode called You Are My Champion. And in that episode, literally step by step, I take you through the explanation of the devil's movements in the Bible throughout history and how Christ finally defeated him. So you can go back and watch that if you want a deeper explanation, because for some of you, this is the first time you've ever heard this. And can I say, I empathize with you because there was, there was a moment where for me also, it was the first time hearing this truth that Satan is no longer our adversary because Christ defeated him and put him in the lake of fire. And it was a lot. And I was like, whoa, God, I want to believe this. It sounds awesome. But that is not what they have preached to me, preached to me my whole life. But this is my response to you. Like when you say people have preached this to you, did you ever go back and check it in the Bible? Did you ever go back and corroborate with the word of God? Or, or did you just assume that because somebody has a microphone, they know what they're talking about? That is not the case. Even friends of mine, who are phenomenal Bible teachers, I check everything that they say. So in today's episode, I am going to cover on a very high level why I say Satan is no longer our adversary. He's no longer the fight that we have been called to in the New Testament, which is the period after the cross of Jesus Christ. I'm going to explain my position on that. There are some people who are still not going to believe me or agree with me. That's fine. Like I said, I'm here to lay out the truth as I understand it today. And if you feel like you can refute, refute that, hey, let's have a discussion. But this is what I believe and I'm going to preach it. So number one, the devil's total defeat. Here's the first thing I want you to understand about Satan, the serpent, is that you don't need to ever fear Satan or his messengers. You don't need to ever fear them. Satan, according to Isaiah 54, was actually created by God. I know some of you are like, huh? Yes, Start reading your Bible, start from Genesis, start from John, start from Isaiah, start somewhere, but start reading the word of God because the word of God says, he says, Isaiah 54 verse 16, behold, I have created the smith that blows the coals in the fire and that brings forth an instrument for his work. And I have created the waster to destroy. This is God speaking. 
Verse 17, no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper and every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is of me, says the Lord. Genesis three, verse one. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. Satan was made amongst the beast of the field, amongst the animal class. He's not even made among the man class or the angel class. He's made among the animal class. And the rest of verse one says, and he said unto the woman, yes, God has said, you shall not eat. Um, of every tree of the garden, or he was asking her that question in Genesis three, verse one. So I'm just establishing to you that Satan is a creative being. There's no reason for us to fear him. He's not even on par with God. God has no rival. God has no equal. He is God alone. <laughs> That's why he kept on saying in the, in the Bible, he says, there is none other besides me. There's no one like me. I alone am your rock. There is no other God besides me. Like it's just the almighty it's God, you know? So God didn't create Satan to do us harm. Man was never meant to touch, let alone eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So when man disobeyed God and he ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that plunged us into darkness, which was the serpent's domain. Okay. But God never intended for us to have any problems with the serpent because we, we were not, he, number one, he's a created being and Adam was never given the choice to eat from the tree of knowledge and good and evil. He was given a commandment not to do that. And God made Adam to understand the consequences, but Adam still chose to disobey. So now we find ourselves in this realm of darkness that we were never meant to live in. But praise be to God who had a plan even before time, who had a plan even when he made creation, that if man were to fail, God will step into this creation to save us from the works of the devil. Is somebody listening to me preach? Now, this is one of the things I love about God is that because the serpent deceived the woman, God decided to use a woman to bring about the serpent's judgment and punishment. Genesis 3.15 says this, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. It shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So we know from scripture, Galatians 4, 4, that Christ is the seed of the woman because he, he says in many times in Isaiah, and an angel shall bear a son. And a, I mean, excuse me, not an angel, a virgin, a virgin shall bear a son, a virgin shall bear a son. So throughout scripture, that was foreshadowed that I'm going to use a woman to bring forth my seed onto the earth. Now, going back to Genesis after Adam's disobedience, you immediately see this serpent seed that had now entered into humanity, the, the consequences of that. First, you see Cain kill his brother Abel. Then after he killed Abel, Seth, which was um, the next seed that Adam and Eve received, the Bible says when Seth's seed line and Cain's seed line began to mix, giants were born in the land and wickedness increased. You can find that in Genesis 1, uh, Genesis 6, excuse me, Genesis 6, 1, verse 2, 45. It became obvious at that point that God could no longer work with Adam's generation. So God chose to take out the first world by water to prepare for a time period where God's spirit would be able to dwell inside of man. And you find that in Genesis chapter six, verse three, where God says, my spirit cannot strive with man from the outside. So God used the flood to start over, to prepare a world that would bring forth a body that God could come and abide in so that God could work out his ultimate plan, which is to get the spirit of God inside of man. So this enmity between uh, the woman and the serpent, you beginning, you begin to see this battle for seed, this animosity, this contention um, between God trying to bring his seed onto the earth and, and Satan trying to bring his seed onto the earth. And you see it immediately with the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11 verses 67, Satan immediately tried to thwart God's purpose by uniting man for his evil plans by building the Tower of Babel. God stopped that plan by dividing their languages, but Satan wasn't done trying. He was going to keep going. And so 
The same way God was working to bring his body onto the earth, Satan kept trying. And in Daniel chapter two, Daniel interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream as four empires. Remember that dream Nebuchadnezzar had? He couldn't find anyone to interpret it. Daniel went and prayed. God gave him the interpretation and the interpretation came back as four empires, four kingdoms that would rule the whole known world, starting with Babylon, because he told Nebuchadnezzar, you Nebuchadnezzar, you, O king, are the head of gold. So this body that had a head and the neck and the chest, the, the waist and the loins, and then the legs and the feet, it was four different parts to this image, to this body. And it, it turned out to be four kingdoms in history that would rule the whole known world. So these kingdoms were in the form of a body. I want you to think about that with me. Why didn't Neb Nebuchadnezzar drink, dream of something that was in the shape of a dog or in the shape of a cat or in the shape of a tree? No, he had a dream about a body. This is spiritual language, guys. He had a dream of an image that was in the shape of a body because those four kingdoms turned out to be the body that Satan would work through to do battle against the Christ. You find that in Psalm chapter two, verses one and two, it says, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. So Satan worked through that image, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and then finally Rome. And he empowered that beast. He empowered that body to do war against the Christ. And then if that wasn't bad enough, Satan infiltrated the system of the law. That's why Jesus called the Pharisees, you children of the devil, you generation of vipers, because they also became infiltrated with Satan. So now you've got the rulers of the temple, Pharisees and Sadducees, allying with the body of Satan, which in that time period was Rome, to do battle together. And so at the cross, you find the greatest battle of all time, which in the book of Revelation, chapter 16, verses 14 and 16, is referred to as Armageddon. Armageddon is not something we're waiting for. It already happened. It happened at the cross. That was where the greatest battle of all time took place, where you have the kingdoms of the world, the rulers of the earth and the wicked generation of Jews who all took their position against the Lord's anointed. However, when they slayed the lamb, they thought they had won when in fact it was the greatest victory for creation. What seemed like the worst day of defeat turned out to be for our greatest victory. Jesus on that cross became the final sacrifice for our sins. He dealt with our sins, he abolished death, and he brought a close to the law of Moses. You can find that in 2 Timothy 1 verse 10 and Romans 10 verse 4. I know I'm going really fast. I'm doing that on purpose because I want to get to the important stuff, which is the stuff on your mind, because trust me, that is the, it's really juicy. But I still need to prove my claim that you don't have a devil problem. Christ dealt with the devil. Okay, moving on. The judgment of the law world and Satan's end. So what happened is that a few years after Jesus' crucifixion, Rome began to invade and destroy Israel, Judea. And this was the due punishment that they brought upon themselves. Because when Pontius Pilate wanted to release Jesus, they said, no, don't release him, kill him and let his blood come upon us and upon our children. So they literally call for the judgment of Jesus' blood to come upon them. Now, Satan and, and the system that represents the kingdoms of the earth, Revelation 20 says, both Satan, which was the dragon, the beast, the system of the kingdoms of the earth, and a false prophet, the law system that got infiltrated with Satan's seed, were all thrown into the eternal furnace, which is described as the lake of fire, Revelation 20, verse 10. And also, we understand that when that event took place, when God finally took the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, and put them in the lake of fire. That is when the temple in heaven, the kingdom, was finally open on earth. And that is when the church was officially born. Is after all of that judgment of the law world was taken care of. All of the judgment of the wicked generation of Jews was removed out of the way. All of the system of the kingdoms of the earth were removed out of the way till today. If you go to Rome, there is nothing left. It is ruins. Rome as an empire is gone. Babylon is gone. Satan gone. The law of Moses animal sacrifice system gone. 
<laughs> all that's left is the kingdom of God on earth, but the earth is still trapped in darkness. Okay. Hebrews 9 verse 8 in Amplified says this, by this, the Holy Spirit points out that the way into the holy, into the true holy of holies is not yet thrown open as long as the former, the outer portion of the tabernacle remains a recognized institution and is still standing. So that verse is telling me that as long as that first tabernacle of Moses was still a recognized institution, the true way into the kingdom could not have been open for you and me. So all of that stuff, the book of Revelation talks about the seals, the trumpets, the vials had to be poured out and the temple burned down and the animal sacrifice system removed out of the way so that you and I could finally enter the kingdom. Okay. There is a method to God's purposes. There is a method to his plan. Everything he does, he does for a purpose. We have to understand his purpose. So in short, the only thing you and I are left with are what? Governments and demons, but it's not Satan himself. Ephesians chapter six, verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities I've described that word before. Principality means a municipality. A municipality is a ruler, a government, in short. Against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. What is that? Demons. So all we are left with is governments, corrupt governments, and demons. Okay? Now, when it comes to demons or the darkness, they can actually do you no harm Except this, they can deceive you by influencing your mind with dark thoughts, which in scripture are also known as strongholds. So the only weapon that darkness has now is deception and strongholds. And all of that has to do with your mind. I'll get back to my teaching in just a minute. I'd like to tell you about two resources from my ministry that I'm sure will really bless you. The first one is my book, A Life in the Spirit, A Simple Guide to Living a Supernatural Lifestyle. If you would like to take your spiritual journey to the next level and really explore what it means to live a supernatural kingdom lifestyle, then this book is for you. It's available now on Amazon.com. The second one is my online Bible course, Understanding the Bible. If you're looking for a fresh perspective to understand the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, then this course is for you. Your faith and confidence in God's goodness will grow. The course is available now at livingword.thinkific.com. And now let's get back to the teaching. Is somebody still with me? Okay, I want to show you something really quickly. So we're talking about you don't have a devil problem. You have a mind problem. And we're going to help you get that sorted out. But if you look at this slide here, and for those of you listening, you, you may want to go check this out when you have an opportunity to do so on YouTube. But you see here, basically, this is a, a picture summarizing everything I've just been sharing with you that there was a definite moment where the serpent was in the garden and he deceived the woman. Adam disobeyed. The next thing Satan tried to do was to build a tower for himself. The Bible says the name of the Lord is a strong tower. So Satan was actually a copycat because everything God wanted to do, Satan tried to do it too. So the name of the Lord is a strong tower, but Satan wanted to build a tower for his name through the Tower of Babel, but God totally squashed that. And this is a fun fact, but on the day of Pentecost, God unites the languages again by giving them the Holy Spirit and the the, un, the gift of speaking in unknown tongues. And everybody began to hear the church speak in their languages. The languages are only united in the spirit of God. But anyways, that's just a fun fact. Going back to this battle uh, of everything Satan tried, then you see how um, they were sent into Babylon. Daniel received that interpretation like, hey, Satan's going to try and build this body for himself to work. But guess what? The stone that was cut loose with our hands, which is Jesus Christ, is going to smote the image on its feet and totally demolish the image. So God is even saying, no matter what Satan tries, I'm going to counter it and I'm going to win. OK, and then um, there was a three and a half year period where of Jesus's ministry, where Satan could not work on the earth. And the book of Revelation in chapter 20, verse three says, that's when Satan was bound. He was bound for a thousand years. A thousand years does not mean millennium. It means a perfect period of time. So the whole time Jesus was on earth, Satan could do nothing except right before Jesus's death, 
He tries to tempt Jesus one more time not to give up his life. Remember, there was a thief on the right, uh, on the, there was a good thief and a bad thief on either side of Jesus. And the bad thief said, if you are really the son of God, you know, let yourself down from here. And that was Satan's last attempt to try and stop the Christ from giving up his life. But he failed. They killed the lamb. When they killed the lamb, the lion roared and everything that God had promised since the beginning was fulfilled. Jesus Christ absolutely took care of Satan, um, defeated him. And he did, Satan did have a 40 year period after the cross that he roared like a lion. But like I just explained to you, that 40 year period was a time of terrible tribulation for the church. And it was also a time period where ironically, the Romans that the Jewish people allied with turned around on them. And eventually there was a huge revolt by the Jews but Rome just sent in Vespasian and they sent in Titus, which were Roman generals, and they put down the uprising and they killed tons of people. Um, and then when they finally got to Jerusalem, they killed everyone in Jerusalem and they only allowed a few people to be slaves, to be their slaves. But other than that, they wiped out that whole place and they burned down the temple. And Revelation 20 verse 10 says, it was after that, that the dragon, which was Satan, the beast and the law, false prophet were thrown into the lake of fire. Okay. That was like, whoo, the quickest, fastest crash course that I could give anyone to explain what I have said so many times is that Christ defeated the serpent for you. He, he came to destroy the works of the devil. Hebrews chapter two says that he tasted death for you. And through his death, he destroyed the one who had the power of death, which was the devil. You are not fighting the devil. You don't have to be afraid of him. You were no match for him anyway. That's why Jesus Christ came to take him on for you. You couldn't take on Satan. Do you get what I'm saying? So here in the New Testament, our battle has shifted from the cross to, can you guess, our minds. At the cross, Jesus accomplished what he came to do. He took the penalty for man's sin and he defeated Satan. John 19 verse 30, Jesus cried out, it is finished. First John 3 verse 8, for this reason, the son of God was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. So Jesus cleansed us by his blood so that we could receive the indwelling spirit. However, there is a however, our minds still need to be renewed. And you can find that in Hebrews 10 verse 22. And Ephesians 4 23. So here, now we're going to get to the stuff I really wanted to get. To. I mean, all of that was important and all of that was good, but I was just like, I want to spend most of my time helping people understand that, you know, the batteries in your mind and to actually leave you with concrete wisdom, concrete tools, concrete, um, disciplines on, on how to, to get a hold of this thing. Okay. So first Corinthians chapter two is where I want to start. Because 1 Corinthians 2 reveals to us the mind of Christ. What exactly is the mind of Christ? How do we receive the mind of Christ? We don't want to hold on to our unrenewed minds. We want to have the mind of Christ. And I'm going to start from verse 9, which says, But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of man, which is in him. Even so, the things of God knows no man, but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit, which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged by no man. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ." Why did I read that whole passage? What am I trying to show you? That the spirit of God in you is the only one who knows the deep things of God, who can reveal to you the deep things of God. And so hence, the mind of Christ is the spirit of God. The spirit of God is the mind of Christ. And guess what? This spirit is on your inside. 
So what is Christ's mind? What does Christ's mind look like? Christ's mind looks like healing, glory, faith, power, hope, love, the purposes of God. That's the mind of Christ. But outside of that, what do you find? Darkness. What's in darkness? Shame, fear, demons, dark thoughts, doubts. We want to make sure that we are abiding in the spirit, abiding in the mind of Christ. So as I was digging into this and studying it and, and really mulling it over, I wondered, I said, I have, I have been able to witness people that have been in revival settings. They've been in revival services. They've attended wonderful revival churches. But at the end of the day, they just came out either doing a lifestyle of sin or some, some of them even worse sin than, than they went into. And I thought to myself, God, what, what's, what's going on here? Like, how can people be in your presence, be in a revival, rolling around on the floor, having a wonderful time in the Holy Spirit, and then get up and say, oh, by the way, I'm still going to go back to sinning. I was like, and I just want to make a distinction that there's a difference between a Christian who sins and confesses it and repents versus a person who is hardened in their heart and is living a lifestyle of sin. I, I really do think that there should be a distinction there. I'm talking about people who are hardened in their hearts and are living settled in their lifestyle of sin. And, I, and, I, and I'm not able to reconcile these things. And so this is what I will tell you I think happens. I can't prove it. It's what I believe, okay? I believe that revival is necessary and it's it's a great um, gift to the church. However, revival only jolts the chains in a person's mind by flooding you with emotions of love and light where you feel the love of God, you feel the presence of God, you 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 sense that God loves you, you feel his presence, it's wonderful. But I, that only breaks up the chains of wrong thinking that darkness has set up in your mind over a period of time. So those experiences by themselves do not necessarily renew or transform your mind. So that's exactly why some Christians can come out of a revival setting and go straight back to a lifestyle of sin or go straight back to their worldly life. Okay? It's because we need to understand that there is an intentional, deliberate, focused renewing of the mind that has to take place in addition to the revival, the presence of God, the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Is somebody following what I'm saying? So renewing your mind, the believer who reads the Bible, studies the word of God for understanding, encounters God through the word and meditates the word, word will have an enlightened mind with light and wisdom and understanding. I have to say that one more time. So we, we, we've contrasted this against there's a person in the presence of God but not really engaging his or her mind in studying the word and being changed by the word of God versus a believer who reads the Bible, studies the word for understanding and counters God through the word and meditates the word will have an enlightened mind with light and wisdom and understanding. This is not a baby in Christ or a child of God. This believer is a son of God, meaning mature. OK, and such a person is ready, is readily able to discern between good and evil and will not fall for the same slight deception and traps that darkness set for Adam and Eve in the beginning. They're not going to fall for those traps. Hebrews 5 verse 13 and 14 say this for everyone that uses milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness for he is a babe. But the strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Come on, somebody. So we need to understand what our battle is and what it isn't. I'm not disputing that darkness is out there, but it's not Satan himself. The only thing that darkness can do now is deceive you and hack your mind. We are still living in time, which is a day of death and a realm of darkness. So guess what? We're going to have to go through some things. We're going to have to go through water and fire. It doesn't mean Satan is after you. It doesn't mean that God is angry with you. It means you have to go through the water and fire. The battle is not, you know, we talk about, oh, I'm in a spiritual battle. Pray for me. I feel like I'm in a battle. Why? What happened? Oh, I lost my job. 
Well, the battle is not when you experience the loss of a job or the loss of finances or the rejection from people. Those things are part of the water and fire that you will go through it, but it will not destroy you. Remember what we read in Isaiah 54, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. I created the destroyer to destroy. I created the waster to destroy, but I guarantee you no weapon formed against you will prosper. But you got to go through water and fire. And remember, fire has cleansing properties. Isaiah prophesied this about the church. Isaiah 43 verse two, it says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall no, not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon you. We don't need to be focused on the water and the fire. We can keep our eyes on Christ and walk through it, knowing that the flames will not kindle us. Come on. That is exactly why Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stories in the Bible to show us that the son of God is not only with us. They had the son of God with them in the furnace. We have him inside of us. That's greater. That's more powerful. If you would ask me. Darkness is what it is. It's a realm of self-destruction. The waster does destroy in darkness, but God's promise to you is no weapon of form against you shall prosper. Now, I want you to notice that God never told us to fight the fire or to fight the destroyer. He tells us to go through it, trusting that he is with us. And as I already pointed out, he is in us. So the real battle here is the attempt to deceive you and to get you off course from God's destination for you. Just like the serpent did to Eve. Did God really say you mustn't eat from every tree of the garden? Did God really say you can't do that? God knows that's not going to happen to you. You're not going to die. It's all these sly, uh, cunning suggestions that come to your mind. I mean, it happened to Jesus Christ. Jesus had to turn to his Number one guy, he had to turn to Peter and say, get thee behind me, Peter. I mean, get thee behind me, Satan. I've changed the Bible. Sorry. I was so into my preaching. I was like, wait a minute. What did I just say? He had to turn to Peter and say, get thee behind me, Satan. And I'm going to read it to you here. It's Matthew 16 from verse 21. From that time forth, Jesus began to show unto his disciples that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised against the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from you, Lord, this shall not be unto you. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, you are an offense unto me, for you savor not the things of God, but those that be of men. Another translation says, you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. He wasn't rebuking Peter because Peter was expressing mindset of Satan. He was expressing the mindset of man, but Jesus called it Satan. So any thought that doesn't originate from God is demonic in nature. I've heard another preacher say that before. I'm going to borrow it because it's really good. Any thought that doesn't originate from God is demonic. He didn't say, get thee behind me, Satan, because you are mindful of the things of Satan. No, get thee behind me, Satan, because you're not mindful of the things of God. You are mindful of the things of man. You don't have the mind of Christ. You have the mind of man, which is already overtaken by darkness. Conclusion, a mind that is not set on the spirit is a mind that will resist the purposes of God. What Peter was suggesting to Jesus, don't die, sounded good, sounded reasonable, sounded like it would be in Jesus's favor, but it was in direct opposition to the purposes of God. So a mind that is not set on the spirit is a mind that will always, always resist the purposes of God. So how do you know when you're being hacked by darkness and where demons are trying to deceive you because they're going to sound like, well, if God is really uh, working through you, then where are all the crowds of people following your ministry? Where are all the crowds of people? Why don't you have more follower followers? If God is really with you, why didn't you get healing in your body from that thing? This is how they come, guys. They're not going to put on a black suit and say, hi, I'm a demon. I've come to deceive you. No, they come with thoughts, suggestions, accusations. 
For most of you listening to me, darkness is unable to tempt you to be uh, an alcoholic, to be a promiscuous person, to be a criminal. So guess what they try instead? They try to get you offended at God, offended at someone else, just to make you stumble and get you off of the path to the purpose that the Lord has for you. This is why Paul learned to do something very important. He said, Herein do I exercise myself, Acts 24, 16. Herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man. Whew. So beloved, how do we do this in a practical way? I have talked so fast. I don't know if I've ever talked this fast. <laughs> I'm trying to pack it all in there. I hope you're still hanging with me. I hope you're enjoying it. But here's what we have to do. We have to take the thoughts captive. You Listen, I, I heard a preacher say one time, you cannot stop a thought from coming to you. But by goodness, you can stop that thought from building a nest in your head. You don't have to let that thing build a whole suburb in your head. It's got houses. What started as a simple suggestion, because you don't take it captive, it builds a whole community block in your mind. You don't have to let thoughts do that. Second Corinthians 10 verse three, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity, every thought to the obedience of Christ, every thought, every thought. Every thought, you need to source your thoughts. You need to investigate your thoughts. You need to scrutinize every thought. Where did this thought come from? Is this coming from God? Is this coming from my emotions? Is this coming from the environment I'm in? Because sometimes you're minding your business, you wander into a new neighborhood or a new city you've never been in. And there's something evil that is that is prevalent in that atmosphere. And that thought tries to come upon you. It could be a thought of violence, a thought of anger, a thought of lust. And you're like, oh, I wasn't struggling with this. Why do I feel this all of a sudden? You're just picking up what's going on in the atmosphere. That's not coming from you. You don't need to allow that to take up residence in you. Hello, somebody. So 2 Corinthians chapter 10, which we just read, helps us to recognize that we have been giving weapons to pull down these strongholds in our minds, not only pull them down, but build an edifice in our minds where the word, the spirit can dwell and abide continually. Romans 10 verse 6 to 8, but the righteousness, which is of faith speaks on this wise, say not in your heart. Who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above? Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead? But what saith it? The word is near you, even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Paul is reminding you that it is not your job to bring Christ down from above or to raise him from the dead. God already did that part. You're to recognize that the word of God is in your heart and your mind. Now, this is important that he says the word is in your heart and in your mouth because you can only speak that which was first a thought in your mind. So Paul is saying this word is in your heart and in your mouth. How does it get into my mouth? It first has to be in my mind. So I have to meditate the word. You have to meditate the word. And here's another important key is, and this is so crucial guys. If you, if, if I don't give you anything else, if you don't do anything else and you just start doing this one thing, I'm about to tell you your whole walk with God will be transformed. And this is what I want to tell you. You must listen to what the spirit of God says inside of you. That is the first key. And he's speaking in your conscience all the time. People are like, I'm just struggling to hear God. Are you listening to your conscience? God speaks to you through your conscience. So when you fully step into Christ, and we've talked about that at length on this podcast, what it means to be in Christ, what it means to be in him, what it means to abide in him, what it means to get out of your mind and into the spirit, in the spirit, in him, in Christ. Oh my gosh, I have described it from so many different angles. Please go back and listen to the previous podcast episodes. I have talked about that in, at length. 
when we fully step into him, we will experience the same oneness with the father that Christ enjoys. So we have to get beyond this place of just reading the Bible stories. We have to truly extract the spirit of God on the pages. You have to open your heart to what the spirit of God is saying. And guess what? The Lord is that spirit. So if you say you love the Lord, you have to love the spirit. The Lord is that spirit. Second Corinthians 3, 17. The spirit of God, he is the comforter, the helper, the teacher who dwells inside of us. We are living in a time where there are two realms coexisting at the same time. We've got light and we've got darkness. We've got the above realm. We've got the beneath realm. You can have darkness in your mind and be on the outside of the kingdom, or you can renew your mind, have a light in your mind and step into the kingdom. And there's even a greater promise than that. What? To possess the kingdom. You actually have to allow the spirit in the word to transform your mind and change your character. That, my friends, is possessing the kingdom of God fully right here on earth. Hmm. This is good stuff, if I may say so. Oh, I want to show you a couple more things. Those of you who are listening uh, for your own benefit, you may want to go check it out on YouTube so you can see these slides I put together because you know me, I believe a picture is worth a thousand words. <laughs> Sometimes when people can just see a visual, it just helps them. But basically what I'm showing you on this visual is a believer outside of the kingdom and a believer that's in the kingdom, in the spirit and the progression that you have to walk through. Now, this figure that you see, you know, next to the cross, this person is saved. They are, they are perfected in their spirit. They have received the gift of righteousness. They've been saved by grace, but their soul is still not saved. Right. And you can see that on the inside of them, they've got the Holy spirit, that bright yellow light in them. That's the Holy spirit. But, but look at what their mind looks like. It looks like a dark shadow it looks dark. Okay. Let me actually show you. I wasn't showing it to you. Now I'm showing you. I was talking it, but I wasn't showing it. Okay, so now you can see this person has a Holy Spirit on the inside, but their mind is still dark. And all around them, they've got different things trying to bombard their mind. They've got fear. They've got wrong darkness, uh, wrong doctrines. They've got darkness. They've got deception, but they love the Lord. The Spirit of God is on their inside. Their mind is not yet there. Their mind is not yet where it want to be. So that's just when you are born again. You are seeing the kingdom. Holy Spirit is inside of you. Your mind is still dark and your mind is still like this barren wasteland that needs to be cultivated into a garden, right? And then right there next to that person, you see this ticket, my little red ticket stub. And it says, die to your will and give up your mind. This is how you're going to enter the kingdom. And I get that from John chapter three, where Jesus said, if you want to see the kingdom, you have to be born again. If you want to enter the kingdom, you have to be born of water and spirit spirit resembles fire fire means a burnt offering a, a living sacrifice you die to your will so when you enter the kingdom now this is the place that was prepared for us jesus talks about it in john chapter 14 moses talks about it in psalm 91 it says it's a secret place of the most high no evil will before you angels will bury you up in your hand bury you up in their hands it's a place of no tears he wipes away every tear it's, it's a place of no sorrow this is a realm in the spirit on earth. And you must understand that the earth is still trapped in darkness. So it's a realm of light and darkness happening at the same time, but you can still abide in the spiritual realm of God while on earth. Now I want you to notice that the next guy, he's got a renewed mind. Now he's entered the kingdom. He's like, Ooh, yeah, my mind is full of light. My mind is renewed. The Holy ghost is inside of me and me and the Holy spirit. We are just flowing. Like God is showing me stuff he wants me to do. And I'm being obedient to him. And the Holy spirit is showing me stuff. He wants me to stop. And I'm just stopping everything. He tells me to stop like this person. This person is meditating the word, renewing the words. Like Ooh, they are just, they, they are on, on cloud heavenly. You know, everybody that sees them is just like, you just on another level. I'm like, yeah, I'm just, I'm just experiencing like, Ooh, God's realm and the spirit is just like, Ooh, it's awesome. 
But that's because they've done the work of renewing our minds, okay? And the last figure that I have on here called Possess the Kingdom, this is not an individual. That's why I made him bigger because this represents the entire body of Christ, right? When we all as a body enter the kingdom and we start to grow, Ephesians 4.13 says, we will arrive at the stature of Christ's fullness. Ooh, come on. When we arrive at the stature of Christ's fullness, that's when God's mind fully becomes our mind. And we arrive at the, the, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, total Christ likeness, total image of Christ as the body of Christ. That's when we're going to possess the kingdom of God. Okay. And the whole time you can see the devil just being tormented in the lake of fire. He's just down there burning. He can't do anything to you. Okay, so again, I'm just trying to visually show people because I think like if you could see it visually, you would understand it more. And first Peter two, verse nine, he says this, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of God who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And in this beautiful picture I put together, I show you earth in the background and I show you these two realms. One is called darkness. The other one is called light. Okay. And I show you how, you know, if darkness is the outer circle, then marvelous light is, is toward the light inside of that, not inside of darkness, but you, you understand what I'm saying? You got to dig a little bit to find this place of marvelous light because it's not obvious to our natural senses. And then the core center of that marvelous light is called the kingdom. So yes, God has translated you from darkness into the marvelous light, but you still have to seek first the kingdom. You still have to enter the kingdom, which is the most core, um, thorough, deepest center of light, if I can describe it that way. And you know what? Ephesians 4 verse 23 says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So again, as a person, you've got your mind, which is the thinking part of your soul. That is the, that is the part of you that we are describing as being darkened. Then you've got your conscience, which is the thinking part of your spirit. And God communicates, God dwells in your spirit and he communicates through your conscience. But you now have to take what God has put in your conscience and bring it to your mind, which is the part of you that is still darkened. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? I hope this is helping you for you to see it. Like the spirit of God, your, your spirit man is the core of who you are. I can't see your spirit, but I know from first uh, Peter five verse 23, that man is a three part being spirit, soul, and body. Okay. So the spirit part of you is the part that got perfected when you believed in Jesus. Your mind is still dark and it is not renewed, but thanks be to God. He gave you his spirit, which is the mind of Christ. So you can take what the spirit of God says to you and bring it because the spirit will only speak truth. And sometimes it's loving truth. It's rebuking, but it's a rebuking that's going to change you into the image of Christ. And you have to agree with the spirit of God when he shows you those things and bring what the spirit is saying into your, what science calls your conscious mind. Okay. Your, your, the prevalent man, the form, the forefront of your mind. Okay. Not just deep in your conscience. You got to bring it to the forefront of your mind. Right. And in this picture, I'm just trying to show you that. And I just thought this was neat that in the same way, You've got your mind, your conscience, and your spirit. The tabernacle was set up in such a way it had an outer core, the inner core, and then the most holy place. So you can even think of yourself as a three-part being. You've got your body, your mind, and then your spirit. Your spirit is like the most holy place. That is where God resides, okay? The Ark of the Covenant has moved from being in a box, in a tabernacle somewhere, to being on your inside. Hello, somebody. Okay, so there's so much more that I wanted to say, but I just feel like um, I may just come back and do this in a part two because I don't want to feel rushed. <laughs> and I think I've already shared a lot of good stuff with you. So I'm going to bring this to a close and then I'm going to come back and finish the rest of it so that 
we can take our time to really dig through it. And if you guys have questions, I invite you to leave me those questions, send me those questions. Maybe I can address them in the part two of this discussion where we are looking at just the power of a transformed mind and how this is the only work this and entering into rest is the only work God wants us to do. Hebrews chapter four, there now remains a rest for the people of God. Make sure you strive to enter this rest. That's what Hebrews four says. And then the other one is be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay. So in conclusion, what is needed? Shalakba, if you're telling me that the devil is not my problem, it's my mind. You've given me some tips. You've given me some concrete things I can start doing. What is needed? What is the conclusion here? The conclusion here is that God only works with his mind and his will. God only works with the mind of Christ. He will not agree with the carnal mind of a Christian. You must be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You must be transformed into in your thinking until God's mind becomes yours. I'll say that again. You have to be transformed in your thinking until the mind of God becomes your mind. Now, when his mind becomes your mind, that's when you're going to possess the kingdom. I want to read you a, a, a verse that is a very famous verse. I, I think I know it by heart and you should too, but it's a very important verse and it's a very common one, but I think it's just, it's great to wrap up our time with this verse. Romans chapter 12, verse two, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God wants to use you to demonstrate his purpose, to demonstrate his kingdom, to demonstrate the perfect will of God. But you have to make a decision not to be conformed to this world. You see, that's what happens when your mind is not renewed as a Christian. You look like the world. You don't look supernatural. You don't look like you're born from above. You don't look like you've been born of God. You don't look like an eternal being. You look like everybody else because you're conformed. Because even though you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, He, the Holy Spirit, does not automatically get into your brain. You have to consciously allow the Spirit of God through your conscience to change the forefront of your mind. You have to consciously take the Word of God, meditate the Word, change your mindset through God's word so that you can be the answer and the solution for creation. All creation is waiting for the sons of God to manifest. And I'm telling you, it's not a fight against the devil because Jesus did that for us. But when he quickened you, when he quickened your spirit, he didn't touch your soul. He didn't touch your mind. He didn't touch your body. That's the work you have to do. Work out your soul salvation with fear and trembling. I pray you've been blessed by this and I look forward to having more discussions on this with you. But let me pray for you before we go. Heavenly Father, you love us so much. You've promised never to leave us, never to forsake us. That is a promise we have from you. And our minds cannot fully wrap around the sufferings of Christ and what he endured just so that we could be cleansed from our sins. What he endured just to take out the devil to remove the accusation, the ordinances of the law out of the way so we can have a new and living way and enter the holiest of all, the presence behind the veil. There's so much you've done for us, Jesus, just so that we can enter this kingdom. And I pray for everyone listening and watching that they will not miss out on their opportunity to be a part of the glorious victory that Jesus Christ has brought for us through the kingdom of God. I pray, Lord, that you give us teachable hearts, humble hearts, that we hear what the Spirit of God is saying through this word and give us the grace to step into all that you've called us to be. I know, God, that you have a plan for the church. I know you have a plan for this precious person listening. And I just pray you will stir them up to say, to say, today's the day. I'm going to get my mind in order. I'm going to clean up this mental junk closet I've got going on in my head. And I'm going to allow the Holy Spirit the word of God to rule in my head. May it be so, Father. I give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoy this week's teaching. 
Listen, there was a lot that I unpacked there. So feel free to listen to it again and spend some time going over the Bible verses. God wants us to understand His Word, and I believe as you grow in understanding the Word more and more, and as you live it out, you're going to impact the world around you. I'm your host and teacher, Shalakwe Oshaba, and I'll see you next time on the Living Word Show. God bless. Thank you.